Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. Well, I'm going to follow Nathan and uh, the Congressman's lead, and I'm going to hold the microphone. I've got to tell you guys, um, it's harder talking to you than any other group I've talked to because you're family. I mean, I, I think about everybody in here, and I can't single anybody out. Everybody helped out in my races. I mean, you know, Randy Bacon stuff, uh, Carl making dinner when we got home. I mean, the Rikers adopted us. They adopted us, you know. Linda would go out door knocking with us. We at home. Carl would have dinner waiting. It was amazing. And so it's real hard to talk to you because it's like talking to my aunts and uncles and my brothers and sisters and my cousins. So here goes. First thing I have to recognize a couple people, Nick Piper, who somebody Nathan introduced me to five years ago, was taping this for our website. So if those of you who don't know Nick, he does great work. He did great work for Nathan, does great work for me. That's number one. Number two is Bernadine Brandenburg, who's my friend. And she's actually more famous than I am. She's a two-time All-American swimmer from the University of Iowa. <laughs> and she's a nurse, so she's teaching me a better way. But uh, <laughs> This year, I also want to recognize Dave and Carol. Um, they have been like paid staff in terms of volunteer stuff. Dave has driven me to a number of speeches, critique speeches, entered data, Carol's entered data. Um, we're to the point where we're ready to start hiring paid staff, but I have to recognize the two of you publicly here in front of all of our friends and say, you guys are helping us to get to the point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Sue, it is six to six? Yes. All right, everybody. Woohoo! Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Well, since all of you do know me so well and it's like being home, what I do with my speeches is I tell people three things about me they may not know, but I've got to change a little bit here and say, you guys probably know this, but I'm going to say it anyhow. I'm going to start by telling you three things about myself. And then I'm going to do some of the economic stuff that Nathan's done. I want to summarize for you some of the data that tells us how deep we're in the mess here. And then I want to talk about some economic planks that I'm running on that I call Feganomics. I know it's cute, Wayne. <laughs> the first thing, three things about me. And Betty knows this. I'm the oldest of 11 children. Okay? So when you have that many kids, you don't have a lot of money but you, we always had enough to eat. And, and we played a lot of sports, and our sport was basketball. We had a basketball hoop in the barn, and we had one on the side of the machine shed. And when you're the oldest, you're always paired with the little kids against the middle kids. So imagine me throwing the basketball to my six-year-old sister or my five-year-old brother and saying, okay, hang on to it. Don't let the big kids take away from you. Well, when you play basketball like that, you learn a number of lessons. The first lesson you learn is play hard, play fair, but you're probably not going to win all the time. You know, the middle kids usually won. We won often enough to keep it interesting. But the second lesson I learned was how to protect vulnerable teammates. And as a bankruptcy lawyer today, I'm still protecting vulnerable teammates. People coming in my door. Just yesterday, a painting drywall guy came in. He's been in business 40 years. He has no work lined up between now and the first of the year. He's got one job lined up after the first of the year. So I'm still there, still protecting vulnerable teammates, helping them to try and hang on. The second thing that you may or may not know about me is I do know how to work hard. Nathan and I knocked on 14,000 doors in 2004 with Linda's help. On our farm, we raised about 300 head of cattle a year and about 1,000 head of hogs by hand. My dad didn't realize there was such a thing as electricity until I left. So we did it with a tiny scoop, a scoop shovel, and a two-bushel basket. And when you feed that many livestock by hand, you realize what hard work is. And you understand that it means that you've got to be reliable. You have to be persistent, and you've got to recognize the value of a job well done. You know, reliability, if you don't eat, or excuse me, if they don't eat, you don't eat. Persistent, you fall down in the mud, you've got to get back up, and you've got to keep carrying feed until they're fed. And a job well done. At the end of the day, when the livestock are dry, they're well fed, you can say, I did that. That's a good thing. The third thing about me is I always have a plan B. And when I was in high school, I was going to farm. 
And my nickname in high school was Farmer Fegan. <laughs> and I actually started farming, and along came Paul Volcker and 21% interest rates. And I had, had to find my own plan B, and that was to go to law school and help farmers. And in my adult life, we're still talking plan B. My painting drywall guy on Friday, we're saying, okay, what are you going to do? What are the plan Bs, C, D, we can do to help you keep your doors open, keep your guys paid? Last year and a half, it's probably been as tough as it's ever been. And as a bankruptcy lawyer, I've been as busy as I've ever been. And sometimes we're down to plan D, E, or F. And while I'm dealing with that, and I'm hearing this from small businesses in Iowa, the guy from New Hartford who's been keeping the seat warm says, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. And I want to say, buddy, who are you talking to? You're not talking to the people I'm talking to. And that was one of the reasons why I decided to get into this race, because I think we can do better. And we need somebody who's in touch with the Iowans who are struggling right now. I mean, you guys all know the story in Muscatine. That story is repeated throughout the state of Iowa. It's repeated throughout the country. Even those people that have a good job have family members that have lost jobs. They've seen coworkers laid off. Everybody, everybody's looking over their shoulder saying, am I going to be able to hang on until this thing turns around? Okay, let me switch gears and let's talk about some of those things. You guys all know the unemployment rate, 9.8%. Yesterday they announced that 531,000 people applied for unemployment for the first time this week. 531,000. That's Des Moines. The whole city of Des Moines got laid off this week. We have 15,100,000 of our fellow Americans who are looking for work, want to work, can't find work. That's scary. We look at our factories. Our factories are less than two-thirds of capacity. Our construction industry is about two-thirds of where they were in September of 2008. Everything is off by at least a third. You look at the banks, last night the FDIC closed seven banks. That brings the total for this year to 106. And the banks that are out there aren't lending. You know, as a bankruptcy lawyer, I always have a list of banks. And when people come to me and say, my banker and I hate each other's guts, is there somebody else that'll take me on? I have a list, I say, yeah, here's some banks that are actually making loans. There are no banks on my list right now. Nobody wants to take on new business. Nobody wants to refinance an existing business. And you look at Wall Street, there's still a lot of turmoil on Wall Street. That said, J.P. Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs both had quarterly profits this last quarter of over $3 billion. Between them, it was almost $6.5 billion. And most of that was speculating on American products. And I got to say, to me, it's immoral that a pirate on Wall Street can speculate on a product and make more than the person in America who made that product. Okay? Then we go to the healthcare thing. And this has been talked to death. You all know the figures. 47 million of us do not have health insurance. The rest of us, and I include myself in this category, have, to use a technical term, crappy insurance. You know, high deductibles, high copays, lots of exclusions. This month was my birthday, so I got to renew my policy. And my insurance guy said, Tom, Sorry, they're not going to cover your back. Uh, some of you may know I've had back problems in the past. My current policy says if I have any trouble with my back this next year, it's all on me. My, my company isn't going to cover a dime. At the same time, you know the costs. The last 10 years, our health care costs have gone up twice as fast as inflation. Twice as fast. In 2009, it gets even better. This year, through the end of September, we've had 2% inflation. 2%. That's not a bad number. Healthcare costs have gone up 10.5%. 10.5, that's five times the rate of inflation. At that rate, if we do nothing, in seven years we'll be paying double what we're paying today. And it's literally breaking our small businesses. When Chrysler filed bankruptcy, their filings claimed that it cost them $1,000 a car for healthcare for their workers and their retirees. And what are you hearing out of the guys out of Washington on the other side? Nothing. You're right, Randy, nothing we got to do something. 